So, has this ever happened to you guys? You see someone with a cool shirt of something you're a fan of, you approach them and say, Hey cool, you're a fan of blank? I love blank. And instead of taking it for the casual statement it is, they almost take it as a challenge. You have now unknowingly been chosen to partake in the battle of nerd cred, congratulations. Dude starts to prod you with all these fandom questions which are seemingly innocent at first. Some of them get admittedly a bit too niche, so you do let them know your knowledge of whatever it is you're talking about is limited. But you do love these particular things about it, and they seem to run with that, almost with a little bit of disapproval, but the conversation goes, for the most part, normally. Then you start to realize they've become like this trivia dispenser for every little thing you bring up, which isn't really bad in itself, but you can tell they're oozing that vibe of wanting to prove something, almost like they're trying to assert their dominance in some strange way. Anything you bring up seems immediately one-upped with actually statements and additional info that isn't all too necessary. I mean, my god, this person's turned into a living Wikipedia page. So of course it eventually starts to get a bit awkward and almost confrontive, so you try Try to back out of the exchange by saying something like, well, it's cool that you like blank. But as their finishing move, they brandish some artifact related to the fandom, which they apparently carry in their bag at all times. And well, you clearly can't top that, so you offer some polite remark and make an excuse to get the hell out of there. Left wondering if they jump straight out of an internet comic? Anyone else have a similarly weird experience, or just me? Yeah, don't be that guy. Hey guys, and welcome back to another video where I'm actually in front of a camera this time and nerding out over some obscure area of pop culture. And speaking of nerds, today's topic will focus on the ever so pleasant issue of geeky or nerdy gatekeeping in the pop culture community. Always fun. The act of which the appointed lords of geekdom determine whether you're a real nerd based on a set of principles more holy than the Ten Commandments. In reality though, it can be an incredibly toxic tendency that's often rooted in insecurity. So what is gatekeeping? I know I briefly skimmed over what it entails, but to provide a clearer definition, here's one from the always reputable Urban Dictionary. To gatekeep is to take it upon yourself to decide who does or doesn't have access or rights to community or particular identity. And it can happen with any interest really, I mean books, relationships, race, even potatoes. But as you can tell from this video's topic, I'll be zeroing in on gatekeeping within mainstream geek culture, so mainly TV, movies, gaming, cosplay, stuff that's mainly related to pop culture. There could also be different ways to gatekeep who does or doesn't get to be part of a community, but this video will mainly focus focus on the arbitrary assessments of knowledge, emotional investment, and opinions within fandoms. Basically the whole mindset of you're not a real nerd or real fan because you haven't consumed as much content or shared the same opinions I do. I've experienced my fair share of this. I've done my fair share of this, uh, and if you've ever been part of any pop culture fandom, it's almost impossible to avoid. And if it sounds like a cringy or ridiculous practice, that's cause it really is. And yep, that is Rain Wilson literally gatekeeping his own show. And yes, I'm gonna hold myself accountable, I definitely was not immune to doing this myself, although looking back, yes, I was definitely an irritating person having this sort of mindset. So all too often we'll hear the terms fake fan or fake geek girl, which I'll get more into later, thrown about by the supposedly welcoming community that geek culture is perceived to be. Thankfully, in my experience at least, they don't seem to make up a majority of the nerd or geek community. I mean, for every gatekeeping douche I've met, there'd be like five incredibly friendly and open-minded people who are just happy to simply share their interests. But still, those are my personal encounters, and whether they make up a minority or majority of the community, you know, it's still a thing, and it's still incredibly cringy and toxic, so let's rant about it. And yes, if you've watched my videos, I have touched on gatekeeping behavior before, but mainly within the cosplay community. For this one, I'll actually dive into how how it's so prevalent within general geek culture. And the ironic thing is, you'd think for a group of people who were once ostracized and picked on for liking the things they do, they'd be happy that more people are trying to get in on the community now, that their interests are more widely accepted and respected. I mean, it's a good thing that being a nerd is cool now, right? Wrong. Sadly for some people, it's this very history of being part of a victimized subculture that's led to this now common impulse to gatekeep their special interests. But before we dive into the details of this mindset, let's firstly look at how the culture of nerdy or geekdom came to be, and how its people and their interests were perceived back in the day. So what are nerd or geek cultures? Many would argue that they are in fact two different things, so if you want to get technical. Geeks are considered to simply be fans of their subjects, while nerds are considered practitioners. That's according to an actual study carried about by the blog Slack Propagation. Now this is a bit of a flimsy distinction, because you could say that practitioners of something would have to be fans of what they're doing to some extent, and really the term is just used to describe people who are super passionate about something, usually out of the norm. So for the sake of simplicity, I'll be using these two terms interchangeably throughout the video, hope you linguistic nerds are 
I'm too bothered. It hasn't been totally confirmed where the term nerd sprouted from, although one of my favorite theories include Dr. Seuss's book, If I Ran a Zoo, in which among the nerds and seersuckers from his imaginary zoo, he brought in a nerd from the land of Katru. Another popular theory is that it came from people saying drunk backwards, implying that nerds are just a bunch of <laughs> square studious losers who'd rather stay in instead of partying all night. Would want to do that. But regardless of how the word first came to be, it was in the 50s when the word nerd and geek first came to mean a square person or a social outcast. The rise of computers helped further propagate use of the word nerd and sort of solidified its definition of a technical, super intelligent person who, at the same time, ignores the trivialities of the social scene, thus bringing with it the stereotype of nerds being socially awkward people. The term geek also came around about the same time, and for those who do want to draw a distinction between the two, the term was more so linked to being obsessed with obscure and even marginalized types of entertainment and media, like Dungeons and Dragons, comic books, and science fiction. But regardless of their differences, both geeks and nerds back in the day had one major thing in common apart from being aficionados of certain interests, and that's being picked on or stigmatized for having the level of passion they did for their sometimes odd yet otherwise harmless hobbies. Now, nerds getting picked on, bullied, and getting wedgies from hell that it would be a new one. The negative stereotype has been around since forever. But why? What did nerds ever do to warrant the scorn of dozens of teen films and unfunny comedies and really most Hollywood media? Or even worse, the massive amounts of real world bullying that grade school kids often face. I think a main reason as to why this is is that assholes are just more likely to sick themselves onto people they deem different. Because I mean, they stand out, they're a minority, them in what army. They're sadly just easier targets. But apart from liking things out of the mainstream, there were a few other insightful factors I found that likely play into this. Noah Berlatsky from The Atlantic suggests that issues of class difference and problematic cultural beliefs may play a key role in this animosity towards nerds. In his article, he shares his story of often getting jumped by grade school jerks for being one of the only students super into arts and crafts, comics, Dungeons and Dragons, and of course, like any textbook nerd, he typically got good grades, better than that of his peers, which, as you can probably guess, didn't help things. So typical geek trope so far, but then he dives into his upbringing and family background and growing up in the deindustrializing city of Wilkes Bar. His dad was a college professor and his mom a social worker, and they had moved into a fairly low income neighborhood in the area for his dad's teaching job. So in contrast, most of his classmates' families had lived in the area for generations, with most of their family members having worked in the coal mining industry. As a result, there was this significant class difference between Berlatsky and his peers, with Berlatsky coming from a more, in his words, intellectual background. Which which led to his good grades and greater interest in, you could say, nerdier subjects. And in turn, according to how he saw things, it sort of turned him into this walking bullseye among spiteful grade schoolers. He states that he wasn't bullied so much for his interests, but rather for being of a more alien, privileged background. But he also addressed how being nerdy or geeky was often defined of culturally accepted gender norms at the time, particularly for guys. Berlatsky explains that rampant homophobic views of the era weren't just exclusive to kids who were gay, although they were definitely and unfortunately the primary victims, but also those who didn't quite fulfill the manly expectations set upon them. Those part of geekier or nerdier subcultures were typically sneered at for not being real men, for choosing more sensitive, intellectual type interests rather than the more masculine, athletic ones, for choosing Dungeons and Dragons and video games over football and other sports. While this was back in the day and most nerds today fortunately can evade these skewed perceptions, I also have no doubt that there are some backwards minds out there who are still probably prone to thinking this way. Another Another popular, if not controversial, take on the whole uncool nerd archetype was by writer and programmer Paul Graham in his highly referenced essay, Why Nerds Are Unpopular. In it, he theorizes that nerds and geeks stereotypically aren't popular because they simply have other, more important things to think about or spend their energy on. He acknowledges that most of them do have the desire to be popular like anybody else, but they simply desire being smart or being an expert in a certain craft more. But of course this isn't to say that bullying or harassment towards them is justified at all. It's simply a case of people people choosing not to conform to mainstream ideals and being ostracized for doing so because humans are terrible. Paul Graham, however, argues that for their passions and for the pursuit of intelligence, most nerds are willing to pay that price, so to speak. Though I want to make it clear here that I don't think there should even be one to begin with. He also talks about how nerds stereotypically tend to be more drawn to niche and studious interests, while the popular kids who pick on them tend to be drawn towards more social activities or hobbies that build on their social cred. And this lends itself to that common idea or trend of nerds and geeks being socially awkward, making them even more of a target for ridicule. 
So why did I just dive into this five minute history lesson of nerd oppression? Well, for one thing, I think that cultural views and the ridiculous ways we tend to judge and stigmatize other fellow humans is fascinating, if not disappointing, but also to clearly highlight the unnecessary social stigmas that these people had to deal with, since this will all tie into the bitter, resentful, and often gatekeeping behavior that we'll see later on. Fortunately though, born out of this harsh treatment came their own little subculture, where nerds and geeks alike could come together and discuss their passions, whether that be the latest competing developments or the complex politics of Middle Earth, without shame or fear of judgment. Like any group of people with a shared interest, a passionate subculture was eventually formed based on a shared love of comics, games, and other niche pop culture fandoms. For those who consider themselves a part of the nerd or geek community would know just how, I guess, freeing and satisfying it feels to be among people who, as luck would have it, are just as into the same weird and niche things you are. There's this really fulfilling sense of belonging to be part of a community who actually gets your references, your near obsessive love for specific genres of entertainment, or who share the same passion you do in taking these things apart and discussing them. And thanks to the internet, these people are easier to find than ever for better or for worse. But apart from their love of sci-fi or superheroes, most geeks and nerds also bonded over the shared sense of social rejection and isolation. It also felt nice to have people who understood your insecurities, the lack of prom dates and party invites you may have experienced in high school, and everything else that made you feel like you didn't quite fit into the norm. And while geek culture is a fun community for the most part, and offers this sense of refuge for all those who felt like they were an outcast all their lives, sharing the title of social outcast also sadly bred this unnecessary feeling of exclusivity, as ironic as that is. Though we'll get more into that. Another thing I want to note is that there's a sort of romanticization that comes with being socially marginalized in this way. But a common tendency is to gloss over the deeper, underlying reasons why they're bullied or looked down upon. And these could tie into personality or character issues, but also broader problems like I mentioned earlier. You know, like homophobic views, racism, classism, and other cultural prejudices. And many instead see their interests as the main target of scorn. Some even see themselves under the misunderstood genius archetype. And sure, there's a comfort in telling oneself that they're ostracized simply because they're envied for their intelligence, their creativity, their talents, that they display an actual passion for something and all these other meatheads aren't. And hey, you know, in some cases that might be true. But simply falling back on this mindset suddenly dismisses all the other factors that come into play. Other and probably more important reasons behind their bullying and harassment. And it allows these deeper issues to continue to silently perpetuate. And that's a whole nother topic to explore on its own, but I do think it's one worth bringing up and thinking about. But anyway, thankfully recent years have seen how these once niche communities have grown into the widely loved and mainstream culture it is today, which you would think would be a really good thing for everyone involved. You'd think? No, I'm a fucking nerd. Years of people teasing me and beating me up in school is a testament to that. You merely adopted the name. I was born in it, molded by it. Fuck you. Face clamps. As we now all know, nerd culture has evolved from being a target of ridicule in the past to now being a pretty largely accepted and even mainstream part of modern society. Convention gatherings have never been more popular, San Diego Comic Con is currently one of the world's largest international events, Marvel has been dominating the movie industry for the last decade, and people can literally make fulfilling careers out of playing video games and even cosplaying. Some of the world's greatest scientists and innovators are now being hailed as rock stars and glorified in the eyes of the media. So what happened? Happened. What's changed? Did we somehow enter the twilight zone between the 90s and now? While Rod Serling would have been proud, we can mainly attribute this change to capitalism. Surprise, surprise. As explained by Mashable, this massive boost of popularity can be traced back to the rise of comic book movies. Back in the day, comic books were a pretty niche field of interest, but they had an extremely loyal, super invested fan base. I mean, these people were spending hundreds of dollars a year just to catch up on their favorite series, and of course, with this came a ton of emotional investment and even formed allegiances based in the superheroes or franchise you were attached to. So of course, investors eventually saw the potential of capitalizing on these passionate consumers and made many attempts to widen the scale of the audience. And to get comic books in the spotlight of more mainstream audiences, they turned to your tried and true mainstream mediums of Hollywood movies and TV. Now of course, there were hits and misses when these ventures first came about, mainly misses who are we kidding, bless you Adam West. And a lot of these adaptations were initially aimed at children in the form of Saturday morning cartoons. Establishing that misinformed stereotype that comics and especially superhero comics were exclusive to kids. But eventually, the industry struck gold with big budget feature films, starting with Richard Donner's Superman in 1978, eventually followed by Tim Burton's Batman movies, getting set aback a little by Schumacher's Batman and Robin. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age! <laughs> 
What a masterpiece. I think you all love this. Until finally finding massive blockbuster success once again with Sam Raimi's Spider-Man films. This in turn sparked a huge superhero film trend in the years that followed, with some highly memeable classics and some of the best adaptations of all time. But it wasn't until the Hollywood beast that we now know as the Marvel Cinematic Universe that superheroes and comic books really found themselves amongst mainstream popular culture. Suddenly, if you weren't watching the latest Avengers, you were out of the loop. Don't know who the Guardians of the Galaxy are? One of Marvel's once arguably more obscure comic series? Have you been to a cinema? For real though, these movies eventually became a staple in popular entertainment and even everyday conversation. And following the success of these films were of course merchandise and tons of them, which only further expanded their audience reach. Once investors were able to get comic books under mainstream attention, they eventually set their sights on other nerdy properties like sci-fi, fantasy, and video games. You see, these interests now well-loved by the masses in forms of shows like Game of Thrones, Black Mirror, and incredibly popular games like Fortnite and Minecraft, whose successes are only skyrocketed by famous online personalities like Ninja and PewDiePie. Nerds and geeks have never been more widely accepted and loved for their talents, and forms of entertainment that once had mere cult followings have never been more ingrained in our daily activities and mainstream culture. So what could ever be the problem, you may ask, as you wait for me to finish this whole setup? Because of course there's a negative to all this, having good things, the thought. So here's where our main video topic finally comes in, and I don't want to be too mean with this. The whole concept of gatekeeping bothers me, but like I said, it's not like I was immune to this way of thinking myself. So I don't want to get up on my high horse and simply shun the people who act this way, which is why I dove into all this context beforehand. But still, I do want to highlight the ways that this sort of behavior enforces some pretty toxic mindsets and perspectives that are just altogether unnecessary. So why was mainstream acceptance for nerd culture eventually met with backlash by some people from the community? Nerds and geeks who felt the need to retain their culture's exclusivity and gatekeep who gets to have the label. After all, isn't this what they all probably hoped for back in the day? An era in which they weren't wedged for simply liking Batman comics? With Hollywood, famous publications, and the internet now shining a positive light on these things, they're essentially part of the in-crowd now. But unfortunately, because geek culture is built on cultural knowledge, as Berlatsky puts it, people will inevitably be prone to judging other people in the community based on their cultural cred. This includes how much you've consumed, what you've consumed, and how long you were into it before everyone else was. Hence the often cringy saying of, I was into it before it was cool. Berlatsky says that it's this knowledge that's used and meant to be used as an identity, and therefore as power, thus creating the unavoidable tendency among nerds to gatekeep. You can't be a real Batman fan unless you know his full name, the entirety of his family tree, and his therapist's social security number. Can't call yourself a true Superman fan unless you walk the moon as a Krypton yourself. But on top of knowledge cred, experience also seems to play a part in the criteria of a true nerd. Like I discussed earlier, plenty of them had to deal with years of stigma and bullying before finally finding comfort in the communities that geek culture had to offer. And I think there's this feeling that it's almost like a rite of passage. At the same time, many are also prone to thinking that, hey, I put this much time and this much effort into honing my craft or nurturing my passion, which in their mind makes them a more deserving member of the culture, and creating the skewed logic that the less passionate or, if you'd like me to use the academic term, the filthy casual aren't as worthy of being part of the club. Of course, it's a really cringy and immature way of seeing things, not to mention the flimsy standards that it sets. I mean, where is the threshold here then? How much expertise and experience, and in what areas, must you build in order to be considered a true nerd of something? It's gonna vary depending on who you ask. I'm willing to bet that those who criticize the casual consumers for being posers are also being scrutinized in the same way by other nerds who know more than them. But as bullshit as all this is, and don't take this as me trying to justify it, it's an expected result when the human human ego meets years of torment. I get that a lot of us can't help but feel miffed that the stuff that we were once made fun of for liking are now being touted as trendy and hip among the very same people who would have roasted them back in the day. And I get that it's tempting and easy to fall into the whole gatekeeping mindset, whether it's bred out of pride or resentment. Like I said, I was pretty obnoxious with this too. But I learned and I think it's important to be aware of just how petty of an issue this is in the grand scheme of things. I mean, it really shouldn't matter at the end of the day and wasting energy on trying to weed out the fake nerds or fuming over casual fans only makes you look bad and elitist. Not to mention and sort of damaging the image of nerd once again for everyone else. Plus, the pros of nerd culture turning mainstream far outweigh the cons in my opinion, which I'll get more into later at the end of this video. A final thing I want to zero in on is this interesting facet of nerdy gatekeeping that's become both a meme and an often used battle cry amongst the most passionate keeper of gates. So let's talk about the fake geek girls. 
Now, it's important to remember that these geeky interests were traditionally dominated by guys. A lot of these products were traditionally made for a male audience in mind, and its industries were comprised of mainly male creators. Hence the common struggle of not quite fitting into masculine expectations, this leading to much of their bullying and stigma. And this has also crafted that default assumption that nerd or geek refers to men. That's why you never hear the term geek boy or geek guy, you just kind of assume it's a dude. And by having a stereotypically male image, it promotes this idea that women are a minority in the community, a rarity in the culture. And as far as consumers go, I don't think we are, at least not anymore. But for the gatekeeping few who cling to this idea, they end up seeing women and girls as the other, people typically outside of the community, which causes alarm bells to ring when they try and enter their exclusive little nerdy clubhouse. There's this impulse to protect their territory. I mean, they already don't share the same sense of marginalization over less than masculine hobbies, which by default knocks them down a few notches in their nerdy experience cred. But there's also this horrifying possibility of these women being alpha females in beta clothing, girls simply pretending to like these nerdy interests to score points among the male geeks and trivializing the whole culture of geekdom in the process. Oh my god. And here's where we meet the notorious and hotly debated archetype of the fake geek girl, everyone's favorite. The insidious female feigning interest in geeky things for that precious male attention. What, you think she might actually be into this stuff? That's absurd, dude. So fucking shit. So this whole fake geek girl idea is pretty much a meme at this point. Thankfully, it's not as non-ironically tossed about by people anymore, mainly because there's now been countless articles and video responses on it that call out how dumb it is. So disregarding people who make money off of representing brands in the nerd community, you know, like booth babes and cosplayers on Patreon, because that's a different little topic of its own altogether. Specifically speaking in the context of your everyday casual scenario, you know, your everyday hobbyists, why a woman or anyone for that matter would go to great lengths in pretending to love something just to gain the approval of strangers is just weird to me. It seems like a lot of unnecessary work with little to no reward. And look, I don't doubt that maybe some people have done this, but let's be real. There are likely anomalies and there are probably deeper issues and insecurities at play there. But these possible fringe cases are completely disproportionate to how the fake geek girl is being framed as this invasion on the community, at least more so back in the day. So why is it such a thing then? What started this paranoia, this resentment towards the idea of fake geek girls and why were they such a threat? Well, it all roots back to geekdom being a mainly male space and toxic perceptions on what it means to be a dude. I'm taking all the following information from an article written by Jay Adidon for Comics Alliance, who's also an associate editor at Dark Horse Comics. He explains the birth and threat of the over-sensationalized fake geek girl with better eloquence and depth than I ever could, so I'll leave a link to his article in the description below, but in summing up his points the best way I can, he basically outlines how geek culture, as I said before, doesn't quite fit the macho and aggressive traditional mold of manhood. He writes it as fostering a more cerebral and less violent model of masculinity, supported by a complementary range of alternative values. But living on the fringes will often breed resentment, anger, anxiety. And a lot of these geek communities, rather than questioning or rejecting the gendered expectations set upon them, a lot of them act upon their defensive bitterness by actually amplifying these ideas within their own circles. Thus, as Eden puts it, masculinity is policed incredibly aggressively within geek communities, as much as in any locker room or frat house. In a way, they sort of transfer their perceived failures on the people they deem culturally inferior. Enter a new era where women are suddenly gaining more visibility in the geek community. In fact, some of them are fostering areas of the culture that are not only female dominated, but unashamedly girly, a huge no-no under the masculine standards of geekdom. And the bitter OG members who've already been primed to react aggressively to newcomers, much more so female newcomers, of course inevitably respond to this with backlash. Some exert their policing in more subtle ways by challenging these women on their credentials, and in other more extreme cases, some may even act with direct aggression. This further deepens that imagined divide between the real geeks and the fake geeks, thus giving birth to the fake geek girl. And the idea that innocent hobbyists hover around pretending to like these interests for mere male attention, we can very likely just chalk that up to insecurity. Like I said, resentment is born out of marginalization and reveling in the existence of fake geek girls sort of feeds the resentful ego of these people, convincing themselves that they are, in fact, central to the lives of these women. But really, that's just one way to look at it, so if you guys have any other good takes on the whole thing, let me know in the comments. But I also want to note that women in geek communities aren't entirely innocent either. Believing in the whole fake geek girl threat can lead to this toxic, I'm not like the other girls sort of mindset, and I know this because I lived it. Yeah, I used to think I was so special for being a girl who owned an Xbox, who read comics, at least more so back then, and who loved superhero films over those cheesy girly rom-coms. I'm so edgy and different. Cringe. Surprise, surprise, I wasn't special. But thinking that I was lent itself to this terrible tendency of credential checking all the other nerdy girls I met. I treated it like it was some competition. There could only be one geek 
cute girl in town. It was gross. It was cringy. Don't be 16 year old me. I think we can safely say that the whole fake geek girl thing, at least in the context of casual hobbyists, isn't real. Most well-functioning adults don't have time for that. But touching on the subject of women who make money off of nerdy brands or selling a geeky persona, be this women who model for video game companies, cosplayers who make money off of Instagram, OnlyFans, Patreon, the notion of them capitalizing on nerd culture can leave many wondering if they really are genuine fans of a subject, and I mean, they could be. Would that be so much of a shock? But even if they aren't, it's really not that big of a deal. If you think they're cheapening your little community, then think of it this way. They're actually marketing it. They're giving your community that extra boost of exposure so more people can get into it. And isn't that a good thing? All right, so final notes. What can we do about gatekeeping in the community? Honestly, sadly, the way I see it, it's inevitable in any hobby, in any field. And it won't go away in geekdom anytime soon. And I don't really think there's a way for us to change that. Berlaski writes that as long as the geek identity is constructed through knowledge, as long as it's defined by how much you know about a certain subject, then quote, its borders will always demand policing. Harsh truths, but we can at least keep in mind a few things so as to not fall into the trap of a gatekeepy mindset. The first thing is that both old school geeks and new geeks can exist at the same time. I know, what an idea. Yeah, that person who just got into superheroes because of the Marvel Cinematic Universe may not have the same in-depth knowledge of the characters as your 20 years of experience in comic reading, but it really shouldn't discredit them as a fan, they just focused on other avenues of the franchise. And hey, their love for the mainstream movies may just get them curious into the classic comics that started it all. It's also important to focus on how the growing mainstreamness of nerd culture has done well to destigmatize these interests. I don't think a lot of us really want to go back to the days where being passionate about certain fandom or work of fiction is grounds for literal shame and harassment. Like those who want to retain the exclusivity of geekdom because it makes you feel special. I'm sorry, but get over yourselves. These interests gaining more exposure and hitting the mainstream could mean one less kid getting picked on or bullied by grade school jerks. It encourages more people to explore what our community has to offer and all the awesome movies, TV shows, and games they might not have even heard of until now. I'd love nothing more than to have more people to talk to about cosplay or Tarantino films or swap obnoxious office references with. I mean, how awesome would it be to have your little fan club expand from the one lonely lunch table to the entire cafeteria? I also do want to make it clear that I'm not trying to promote some Molly coddled culture here. I have my strong opinions on movies, TV, and other forms of Hollywood media. If you were my friend, you would know just how much I want to rant or fangirl about fiction 24-7. So a lot of these are positive thoughts, while some can be more harsh and critical, like much more harsh and critical. And honestly, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a critical consumer. I don't see anything wrong with playfully teasing or making jabs at someone for their pop culture opinions or for the types of media they consume. Keep in mind the key word here is playfully. Like my friends and I, we give each other shit all the time for the stuff that we like. It's when these turn into personal attacks, or you start thinking that they're not worthy of consuming anything under that umbrella of entertainment, that it starts to become a gatekeepy issue. As Simon Brew from Den of Geek wrote, do it with a sense of fun rather than turning it into a personal crusade against someone who likes something that doesn't quite do it for you. Anyway, that about does it for this video. I know it was another long one, but there were just so many nuances and opinionated sides to the topic. I sort of wanted to touch on all of them, but there were just too many, so I just decided to highlight the strongest points and arguments I found. But plenty of these topics still do warrant discussion, so do let me know your thoughts on anything I've touched on below. And if you like these kinds of video essays and commentary videos, on pop culture and Hollywood entertainment. Be sure to subscribe because I've got plenty more of these videos underway. And yeah, I'll catch you guys in the next video. It is 3 a.m. here and I'm about to pass out. Bye guys. In brightest day, in blackest night, no posers shall escape my sight.